Hi everyone, this is Alexander Lim, and welcome to Author Story, where every episode we speak to various authors on various topics of interest. We have a somewhat relaxing episode today because the topic concerns an iconic landmark which is related to a well-known American essayist and philosopher, Henry David Thoreau. Our guest is Professor Robert Thorson, who is a professor of geology, a columnist, and a speaker whose hobbies include nature, cooking, and public television. He authored this episode's featured book, The Guide to Walden Pond, an exploration of the history, nature, landscape, and literature of one of America's most iconic places. And you can check out his book right now by clicking on the Amazon link in the video description below. So Thor, welcome to Author Story. Thanks lots for being our guest. Uh, thank you, it's nice to be here. Cool, uh, Thor, what made you decide to write uh, The Guide to Walden Pond? Well, I've been running field trips to Walden Pond for a number of years. Hmm. And this last bicentennial summer, that is the bicentennial of Henry Thoreau's birth, there were celebrations all over the place. Hmm. And I got invited by three national groups to give tours of the pond. Hmm. And I started upgrading a student handout into a pamphlet. And my wife suggested that I just go ahead and write a guide. Hmm. And I was surprised to find that there wasn't uh, a guide for a place that has at least half a million visits per year. So I decided to write one. Okay. All right. Cool. So essentially, this this is a guidebook, right? And um, did you ever plan on for like writing a guidebook in the first place? No, it wasn't one of my issues. Uh, okay. The previous few years, I'd been working on two scholarly books on Henry Thoreau for Harvard Press, okay. and that's a far cry from a guidebook. Yes. But yes. what happened was I just uh, decided to write a guide, and there's some difference between a guide and a guidebook, and it really is both. It says guide in the title, but on the back it talks about a guidebook because it's nice and small and it's in color and it has yeah. you know, trails and nature and things like that. So it, yeah. it is a guidebook, but we'd like the reader to think there's more to it than that, um, the essays inside the chapters. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So let's go in a little bit into two major elements of the book. First, let's talk about the man, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, because we've got listeners all over the place, uh, Thor. Uh, for the benefit of those who haven't heard of him, uh, who is he? Well, he's arguably the patron saint of the American environmental movement. Mm -hmm. uh, his book, Walden, published in 1854 and begun in 1845, mm -hmm. um, is uh, the beginning point for much of um, America's nature writing and much of the political uh, uh, movement associated with environmental conservation and preservation. Mm -hmm. Most of it goes back to Walden mm -hmm. uh, or Life in the Woods, which was the title of his book. Mm -hmm. Now, who is Thoreau? Um, well, he's the one that wrote that book and a number of other things, but he was born in 1817 uh, in Concord, Massachusetts, and he spent nearly his whole life there and he focused on writing and thinking and contemplating deeply about a sense of place, a home sense, rather than being a worldly traveler like his uh, compatriots were. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really what he's best known for. He's also known for civil disobedience. He's also known for walking, other books, Cape Cod, the Maine wilderness, mm -hmm. a variety of uh, pieces of literature that are uh, really quite famous. and. Walden is arguably the most well-studied work of uh, literary nonfiction, 19th century in the United States. Wow. Okay. So, all right. So he, he is. We can say then that he's uh, his influence is pretty significant then. Yes. Yes. In, uh, in the United States literature, as well as in the as you mentioned the environmental uh, environmental aspect. Well, even overseas, I mean, he was a profound influence on Gandhi. Uh, he was a profound influence on Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and Leo Tolstoy and a whole series of writers. Uh, in the guide are, is a short list of 30 uh, writers that have been influenced profoundly by Henry David Thoreau. And each of those ones he influenced, I mean, they were influencers themselves, like you mentioned, Guy, Gandhi and, yes. and other guys like that. Wow. Okay. So cool. So uh, let's get to the, the second element in this book. It's, it's, it's the pond itself, Walden Pond. Uh, let's get a little bit first of the basic facts. Where is this, what is this pond and where is it located? Well, the pond is in Concord, Massachusetts, about a mile and a quarter south of the village center. Mm -hmm. And that village center is now uh, more or less a suburb of Boston. 
um, uh, it's 18 miles west of Boston, and it was then by carriage train, a uh, considerable distance, but now it's linked by the railroad, and so people can ride in and out on the commuter rail. Right. Uh, still a lovely village, uh, noted for its history, noted for the uh, uh, the sort of the, the launching pad of American transcendentalism or the uh, local version of the Romantic movement in the in the mid nineteenth century. So it's a lovely lovely spot, full of full of writers and thinkers and and nature lovers and um, in the greater Boston area. So that's Concord itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. The pond is located to the south, about a mile and a quarter, and it's an isolated lake within a chain of small lakes. Mm. And I use the word lake because it's more than ten acres and it's very deep, so okay. it qualifies okay. as a lake administratively. But right. it's known as a pond. Okay. And it's just got that geographic place name, and that dates way back to Puritan conventions mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, 17th century. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's just a lovely small place, 62 acres, uh, mm -hmm. surrounded by woodland. It's mm -hmm. the centerpiece of a state reservation, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a state park, but it's mm -hmm. so old that it predates the park system. So it retains wow. its original mm -hmm. archaic name, Walden Pond State Reservation. But it's okay. effectively... An internationally famous state park, right. if you figure that out, um, right. and and it's it's visited by so many people that they had to limit the number that hmm. arrived there. Back in the 1970s, they cut daily attendance to a thousand people, and basically the parking lot on a nice day will fill up by about 10 in the morning, and they don't let anybody else in there. All right. And the parking space opens. And of course, people infiltrate through the woods and on the trails and in other ways. <clears throat> but that's the only way that they can maintain the pond uh, in the uh, sort of spirit of Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, which is part of the Dean language. Mm -hmm. right. And at the same time, at the same time, they have to allow public swimming because that's part of the Dean language. Right. Okay. And so they're kind of stuck. And so the the name for the agency, the state agency that runs it, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, is trying to balance, uh, you know, two sometimes opposing forces, conservation right. and recreation. Right. And it would be a little bit like naming a state agency, you know, the Department of Good and Evil or the Department of Black and White or the right. Department of Apples and Oranges, you know, because these, these are two things under the same agency, right. almost purposes. And I, I have to say, I think they've done a wonderful job mm. with a nearly impossible task of yeah. balancing those two needs. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is like, a, this. For, I mean, given Thoreau's importance, this is places kind of like a place of pilgrimage almost. It and, is. You know, you got, you got to balance the uh, visitors with the environmental impact. I'll offer myself as an example. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, in college during the first Earth Day years, uh, 1970, early 70s, late 60s, uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau became very important for me as an example, having read Walden. And he was on flags and t-shirts and, and posters and bumper stickers and even the U.S. postage stamp mm -hmm. nearly everywhere for his commitment to nonviolent resistance, to civil rights, to environmental conservation, and so forth. So he was a, an important uh, dude, if you like, in in 1970s culture for me, right. but I'd never been to Walden Pond and I was mm -hmm. living in Alaska and a variety of other states. Mm -hmm. And when I moved from Alaska to New England mm -hmm. in 1984, I thought, well, at least <clears throat> I will be moving nearer Walden Pond. Mm -hmm. And within a year I visited uh, the pond and made a pilgrimage mm -hmm. as do many, many people since 1872. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a pilgrimage, and I dropped a stone on the Karen from Alaska, mm -hmm. and thus inaugurated my personal relationship with Walden Pond in 1985. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what is what is the draw of the pond to, I mean, to Henry to Henry David Thoreau, even to yourself and to others who who visit uh, who visit time and time again. Well, the draw now is mostly because it's the site of uh, the most famous book about place in America, right. Walden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for Thoreau, and uh, it was basically a, a place where he could get away from the, the hurriedness of normal life mm -hmm. and, and relax and write and think and contemplate mm -hmm. uh, in the presence of a beautiful, clean, but otherwise fairly ordinary, uh, a small lake. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, the lake itself, surrounded by woods, has an almost a, a symmetrical, roundish uh, shape from where he lived. All right. And uh, it suggested all kinds of things, resilience, purity, uh, symmetry, simplicity, um, uh, you know, and any number of attributes that he had within himself that he could see reflected in the pond. Wow. At one point, he looked into the pond and said, Walden, is that you? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. He self-identified with the place. And the place, of course, is he recognized was, was way nicer than he was. Okay. Uh, you know, he's trying to be as pure as the pond. He's trying to be as simple as the pond. Mm-hmm. He's trying to be as tough as the pond is in surviving onslaughts left right. and right. Right. So it's a it's a source of inspiration. And another thing about the uh, Walden Pond is where he lived and where he located himself in the morning. He could watch the sunrise over the pond, mm. and and so he greeted each day with a sunrise on the pond, mm. and that became a metaphor for the annual cycle, which became a metaphor for you know anyone's life. Uh, it's it's really about rebirth. Mm. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, before we continue, Thor, I just like to uh, address an issue on, on pronunciation because I pronounce uh, I pronounce uh, Henry David's name as Thoreau, and you pronounce this Thoreau. So uh, yeah. is there any difference between the pronunciations? Well, yeah, there's a difference in the way they sound, but yes. both are acceptable. Okay. And the reason is is that is that uh, until the last 10 years or so mm-hmm. everybody said Thoreau, you know, okay. Henry David Thoreau. Okay. And 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 that's fine. Um, but if you actually read the literature and his own, you know, Thoreau's own journals entries and mm-hmm. those of his friends and Edward Emerson, a young friend that he had, you know, he's very very specific on how to pronounce the name. Oh, okay. And you know, I can hardly even get it right. You know, it's it's Thoreau. <laughs> Or it's thorough, you know, depending on how you want to enunciate that. Okay. But, uh, but they're all fine. Mm. Okay. All right. Cool. So, uh, get, getting back to the topic, um, Walden Pond. I mean, and Thoreau's Walden. Um, this 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 pond's been well known since the middle of the nineteenth century. And in your book, you offered four things that made that made Walden special. Um, would you uh, now these four things? I'm not mistaken. Are like stuff like landscape, nature, solitude, and writing. What is it that makes these elements so special? It's it's hard to say. Uh, okay. I mean, it's special because of the writing. Well, Henry Thoreau, you know, didn't just dash this off as a first draft. Uh-huh. He wrote seven drafts of Walden. Okay. With a quill pen dipped into ink on a small green desk using manuscript paper. Mm-hmm. And seven drafts took nine years. All right. And in two great bursts of energy. Mm-hmm. You know, the first was uh, uh, mainly about human beings and, um, and society. Mm-hmm. You could argue in the old 19th century language, it was about man versus society, you know. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was, um, was essentially man and nature. Mm-hmm. And so this, the second burst of activity was informed by his deep reading in in natural history, especially uh, Charles Darwin's The Voyage of the Beagle Mm -hmm. and the earlier travels of Alexander Humboldt. I mean, he was profoundly influenced by the uh, sort of exploration style nature writing Mm -hmm. and and natural science of the day. And so what happened was he went out first to to uh, to to Walden to to basically write, but also to reflect on human social relationships. Mm. And then he went out later after a three-year hiatus to reflect mainly on on the humans and nature. And those two got paired together very nicely within the book. Mm-hmm. And um, and it ended up being a book about all of those things. All right. Which is all the more famous. So that's the writing piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, seven drafts in, in nine years in right. two great bursts of energy. And this was after a a Harvard College graduate degree, I mean, not graduate, but he graduated with a degree mm-hmm. with an emphasis on language and literature mm-hmm. and writing. Yeah. And he had 
he had excellent training and extremely hard work. And he also had good editors. Margaret Fuller was an editor for him. Mm-hmm. Emerson was an editor. His sister, Sophia, was an editor. Mm-hmm. Uh, people edited him carefully, too. So, mm-hmm. so it was um, a lot, a lot of work. All right. Another thing that made Walden special is the lake itself is, is, um, is really quite pure and quite symmetrical, mm-hmm. uh, especially in Thoreau's day, and very, very deep. Mm-hmm. And he used the word, he used deep as a metaphor for, you know, the deepness of reflection. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are, those are really the two, two most important things. Solitude is another one. Mm-hmm. He located himself not in the wilderness or anything like that. He was right on a, on a sort of a carriage road to the pond that was pretty mm-hmm. typically used by a lot of people. In fact, he cited his out right, right next to the carriage road. Okay. To the pond. And he wasn't really trying to escape, um, uh, you know, society and live in the wilderness, he was trying to find a place of remove where he could reflect on it. Uh, mm-hmm. He wanted to be at the at the tension point between the two, mm-hmm. on the edge uh, or on the margin of society, right. looking back at it. That was his focus. He wasn't really an escapist. Mm-hmm. In fact, his house site is located at a triple point with one direction being the railroad where he could walk it to visit his family right. who lived on the side of the tracks. Right. Then he could walk it to the north and to the east, and he would easily be within Emerson's parlor within half an hour, you know, where he could meet, meet with a circle of friends or walk the village street. Mm-hmm. And the third direction went down to the water itself. Mm-hmm. And so whenever he, you know, felt like it, he could go in any of those three directions. And he often went into the village or to his family, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes daily. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so the, the, the concept would be sometimes think of... Uh... Thoreau is like he's he's like totally isolated and he's just writing, but this really is not the case. He was connected to not at all. Was, nature and, more, yeah. Yeah, he had more friends and more visitors when he lived out at the pond than he did in town. Oh, okay. <laughs> he became a curiosity, you could argue, a local celebrity. Uh-huh. And he had as many as thirty people in his uh, in his little one room house at once. So his little house is uh, basically the floor plan is 10 feet by by 15 feet long. Uh-huh. Inside that house was uh, one of the meetings, uh, maybe the second meeting, of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society. Mm-hmm. And one of, they were organized by his sister and his mother. And that's out there in, in Walden Woods. Uh-huh. And one of the speakers was uh, 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 an escaped uh, 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 slave. Uh-huh. So... You know, so it's it's not a place of remove. He had people yeah. bunk with him for night after night, you know, and, and the most famous night, the cabin was empty and people call it a cabin. And so I automatically say that it definitely wasn't a cabin, mm-hmm. but everybody wants to call it a cabin. Right. Uh, he was in jail in town for refusing to pay his taxes to support the war uh, with Mexico. Mm-hmm. And it, the, so the, the house stood empty. Okay. And it also stood empty when he went up to uh, to Maine for uh, various wilderness sojourns. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay, it, it, it's, it was really a place where he wrote and where he slept at night and wandered around during the day. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. Cool. Got that. So, um, on th- now in the guide, the guide uh, essentially talks about four parts of the tour around Walden P- Pond. There's um, our the northeast section. Uh, mm-hmm. which is you called our world and the northwest section Thoreau's world then mm-hmm. southwest Walden Star and then southeast you mentioned called this re-entry what yes. is the particular nature of each of these particular sections well they're they're different I think the first one is I, t- I subtitle it the northeast sector mm-hmm. basically if you imagine a a roughly elliptical lake, and you can divide it into four corners, if you like, or four quadrants, or four sectors. Mm -hmm. And the northeast one is basically where people park, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pay their parking fee, go in, look at the visitor center, maybe buy a guide book, whatever. That's, it's all modern. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, and if you look at the stops near the beach over there, and if you look at the trailhead and the crossing, there's blinking LED lights and solar panels, and the entire eastern shore of Walden Pond is a a 20th century engineering construction of sand and concrete and, and stone, right. and even old stone walls. So it's thoroughly modern. Even the trees there are modern. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with modern. We live in the modern world. Yeah. But um, to really experience the uh, Henry Thoreau's Walden, you need to walk west about uh, 
of a third to a half a mile. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you'll go around a very steep ridge that today is easy to cross because mm -hmm. there's a trail right on it. Okay. It was excavated into the bank. But in Thoreau's day, that was really a very, very difficult walk. Mm -hmm. And so um, he really lived over in the northwestern part of the pond, mm -hmm. which I call Thoreau's world. That's mm -hmm. the historic, authentic landscape of his world with the tree, three trails that I talked about before. That's where he had his, his bean field and his, his waterfront access and his uh, favorite meadow. And one thing after another is all in that place. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the northwest sector. And then we'll keep coming counterclockwise around the pond. We'll enter the, the third sector that I call Walden's Star. Mm -hmm. And I do that because that's the sector of the pond that has three coves. There's a fourth one. Mm -hmm. um, and these are like the points on a star. Uh, each is a triangular tip in an otherwise circular uh, lake. Mm -hmm. And that lake is the western basin. Mm -hmm. And so I call it Walden's Star. And what that is is a, a, a broader open opportunity to reflect on different parts of the history. Mm. Um, these are connected mainly to the railroad to the West. Mm -hmm. Right now, everybody accesses the pond with, um, with their automobile parking, you know, coming right. in on Highway 26. Right. But um, prior to 1902, when the first automobile cruised by there, all of the access was on the Western side. Right via the railroad. In fact, there was a railroad station on the west edge of Walden Pond, mm -hmm. and it disgorged thousands of passengers uh, on summer days and weekends um, uh, for a th amusement park mm -hmm. that had a racetrack and a ball field and, uh, and swing sets and park trails and pavilions and picnic grounds and you name it, they had it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a Victorian era uh, park accessed uh, mm -hmm. from the railroad that opened in 1866, I believe, mm -hmm. and closed in 1902 when it burned down. Mm -hmm. And thousands and thousands of people came out on summer days. And some of them walked up to where Thoreau used to live, mm -hmm. and they began to, um, you know, commemorate that house site mm -hmm. with a pebble put down or a cobble from the shore put down in place. And it was begun with by a Mrs. Adams in 1872 in the presence of Bronson Alcott. Mm -hmm. And people have been coming um, ever since to pay their respects to the place where that extraordinary book, Walden, was written. Okay. Oh, go wait a minute. I yeah, forgot go one. Ahead. That's, go ahead. Walden. Oh, that's the third sector. Yeah. The fourth sector is reentry. And what we deliberately wanted to do was juxtapose the finest view of the whole lake mm. or of the whole pond from a place called Panorama, mm. followed by just a quiet, reflective walk back to re the real world. Right. And that last stop uh, is called reentry. And what we wanted to do was to look left at the historic landscape and then look right at the modern landscape and mm. think about the, the changes that have happened. Right. Um, and then contemplate them on the way back to the visitor center where the trip is over. So, right. so this is the, the loose narrative structure or travel journey that's typical of, of a lot of travel literature. You know, you start in one place, you make a trip, yep. and then you're yep. done. And that's what carries the book forward is the traveling through those landscapes. Right. Okay, cool. And, and you know, uh, the book, it's got some very, very nice pictures, very nice photographs, you know, of all the the flora, the fauna, the plants, the animals, and the panoramic shots. I mean, I get a sense of the peacefulness of the place, even if I haven't been there. It is very peaceful. There's something about the clarity of the water and the angle of the shore and the isolation of the lake in the midst of the greater Boston metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's completely wooded around the shoreline. And how many 62-acre lakes, you know, within 20 miles of Boston, uh, within the loop of Highway 495, mm -hmm. you know, are completely surrounded by by large trees mm -hmm. with not one house visible mm -hmm. except the bathhouse that's public. Right. So this is this is really like uh, you, you can say this is something like um, untouched territory. Then even though I mean, all, all the facilities have been set up it's still like you can just go there and just think, wow, this place has no one's been here at all. Yeah, you could think that, but that would be not true because yeah. all of the trees were cut down at some yeah. point. 
Yeah. And um, and when you say untouched, you know, the that begs the question by what? Yes, I mean, during yes. the atomic bomb testing eras of the 1950s and 60s, all that fallout was falling into uh, Walden Pond just as surely as it was anywhere else. Mm. Um, there's been a recent study of, um, of uh, changes in the pond over the last 1800 years mm -hmm. and, you know, based from sediment core work uh, that's been going on since 1979. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, so you can tell what happened to the pond over the recent history mm. by looking at its sediments. Right. And what we noticed is that you know it's it, it is now being transformed um, by you know human pollution um, and by by um, you know climate warming. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a an increase in the number of um, uh, well, let's put it this way: the the, the microflora of the pond, you know, the right. algae and things that live in it, are changing. And they're changing the response to things that we're doing. So right. you could do untouched. And that's okay because the trees have grown back big right. time. Right. They were last cut over in um, right around the turn of the century. But mm -hmm. the white pines and the scrub pitch pines, they grow pretty vigorously. Mm -hmm. And if you cut them all down, like you can go to one of the stops called Bear Peak. Mm -hmm. And a picture in the book shows Bear Peak just completely cut over and clear cut of its trees in 1918. But if you go there today, it looks fully forested with nice, tall, vigorous pines. Mm -hmm. Okay, got that. Cool. So really, this is, uh, yeah, so, I mean, we, we leave it's a, a mark on, on even a place like Walden Pond. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. And it, the human population is very, very different, too. Mm -hmm. Now tourists come from everywhere. I mean, if you go back just less than a century... I mean, it was a scary, dangerous place, especially for women to walk alone. And now, you know, everybody just comes and goes with impunity. Right. right. You know, it's multiracial, multiethnic, multi-economics, uh, uh, multi-everything. I mean, anybody goes and a lot of people go. Mm -hmm. They go for different reasons. I mean, the, the internationals, which are many, 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 they go to honor the birthplace, or not the birthplace, but the, the birthplace of Walden, you know, in that little writing spot right. uh, and but uh, you know many people who live within say easy access come just to swim and they could care less about Henry Thoreau mm, okay. uh, and there are marathon and triathlon swimmers that are they're practicing every single morning mm. uh, there are bird watchers that want to just take a walk mm -hmm. people come for lots of reasons all right, cool. So, Thor, I take it you, you've been to Walden Pond several times, uh, well, am I correct? Many times. Yeah, I've been running field trips for an honors course at the University of Connecticut uh, in American Studies. I've been running those trips since 2004. Mm, okay. So I, I'm sure you're familiar with them, then with the relative peace and quiet of the pond and, you know, the... Yeah the possibility of connecting nature there. So, Thor, let me just say that you came across someone who's, you know, who's tired of everyday hectic electronic life, all the smartphones and all that stuff, mm -hmm. is longing for a bit of solitude or recon reconnection with nature. And you had only time to tell that person one thing. What would be that one thing you tell that person? Why? Well, what what I would say is, is turn your phone off, disconnect a little bit, and, okay. and I would go back to the um, uh, to Thoreau's message, which was the same as as Ralph Waldo Emerson's message of self-reliance, which was the same as Emerson's mentor William Ellery Channing's message of self-culture, mm -hmm. and that is that you know look inside yourself, explore as Henry Thoreau said the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean of your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. Look into yourself, uh, find out who you are, and do so internally and then then go outward and share that outward with human community there's nothing selfish about starting from within and defining your relationships in an outward direction what you don't want to do is define yourself by what everybody else thinks about right. you okay and i think i think it's pretty amazing that you know such thoughts they were they were voiced out like in the last in the 19th century and they're still applicable uh, Absolutely. 21st Thoreau's, century. Yeah, Thoreau's case of the telegraph. You know, I mean, the telegraph was just coming in between the time he first visited the pond and when he left it. And he thought, what a strange thing that is. You know, what would Texas have to say with New England? You right. know, why would it matter? I mean, he was simultaneously interested in 
new technology, uh, and I'm very concerned about the costs of it. In fact, there's a line in Walden that said, uh, uh, "Lo, we have become tools of our tools." Mm-hmm. You know, we we want to use our electronic devices, you know, as a tool to help us improve our lives, but we don't want them to define our lives or control our lives. Right. And the issue for him with the telegraph was the same. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, telegraph te- is definitely new technology for him. It's very applicable, like the impact of our own technology in our time. Yes, absolutely. All right, cool. We're talking by Skype right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's an example right there. Hey. <laughs> right. You're in one place and I'm in another. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so uh, Thor, um, you know, it's great talking to you, but I got to wrap up. So right. to our listeners, in closing, the book is The Guide to Walden Pond, an exploration of the history, nature, landscape, and literature of one of America's most iconic places. The author is our guest, Professor Robert Thorson, and you can get his book on Amazon. So Thor, thanks lots mm-hmm. for being an author story. It was really fun chatting with you. Good. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I hope that you uh, get something out of the guide. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So everyone, go ahead and check out The Guide to Walden Pond. And of course, feel free to subscribe to our channel. Uh, catch you all next time on our author story weekly interviews with another amazing author.